Hi everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about how you can get input from a user after your program is already running. The programs that we've written so far run and completed without any user interaction required, but in real life that's not very typical. If you think about a program such as a self-driving car, that's going to be needing inputs constantly about the road conditions, the gas pedal, things like that that you as the user would be experiencing or that the car sensors would be able to detect or even something like YouTube. It's going to be waiting there for a user to type into the search box what type of video you want to watch or maybe you're going to put in a URL and then the YouTube program will then play a video for you. The program that we're going to create today is going to prompt the user, in which case us, for two different numbers and then it's going to perform some sort of arithmetic on those numbers. And by the end of this video, you'll know how to prompt the user for basic input using the scanner class that comes with the Java language. All right, so I've got the IDE up and I'm going to select new project. I'm going to go ahead and call this one user input in the code directory and add sample code. If you'd like a reminder on how to do these sorts of things and get this main.java class with the main method, check out one of the previous videos in the Java Fundamentals series that I've started here. All right, so we can go ahead and get rid of this system.out.print line. That's a neat hotkey that comes with the IDE in Windows. That is Control Y or Yank. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about the scanner class, which I mentioned at the beginning. Because it's a class, it's capitalized, so you type in scanner, that's the name of the type. In a previous video, we talked about primitive types, where they are lowercase and they're orange, meaning that they're keywords. An object or a capital type like this, scanner, is what's called a reference type, and it is different from primitives, but they're still types in the Java language and they represent what we call objects. I'll go in a future video about how an object works and what you can do with objects. But basically this is the type. Now we need to give our variable a name. I'm going to call it user data. If I just throw a semicolon there just to start. The first thing that IntelliJ is telling me is, is this Java util scanner? Hit Alt Enter if so. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Alt Enter. And what that just did is it added this import statement right here. We haven't had to look at import statements very much because everything we've done thus far has been within the java.lang package. What I mean by package is that Java source code is distributed between these different containers, what we would call packages. When you need to import data outside of the package you're currently in, you use this import keyword, and then you spell out the fully qualified name of where that class comes from. So the class name is scanner, and it comes from java.util. So that's what this import statement is doing for us. And IntelliJ detected that we hadn't imported Java Util Scanner yet, so it noticed that we used the scanner class right here. And it asked us, hey, do you mean Java Util Scanner? And yes, we did. Okay, so now that we have declared a variable, let's assign it to something. So it's going to be equal to a scanner. But now I need to do more with this. It's hovering over here saying that this is a method call. Well, I'm actually going to create what's called a new scanner. So I'm going to throw in that new operator right there, that new keyword. That means I want to create what's called a new instance of a scanner variable. But I'm still getting this issue right here. This says it can't resolve a constructor. And then it gives me all these candidates. So basically what this is, is that I need to pass in some sort of parameter to this scanner class in order to make my variable. So what am I really scanning? I am scanning for user input data and Java's user input data is called system.in. Our user data variable is equal to a new instance of a scanner over 
user input. I'm going to go ahead and comment this line of code because it's good practice to make sure your code is documented. And the other thing you want to do with the scanner class, which is a little special, is when you're done using it, you want to close it. Now, the way in which you can access operations on an object like scanner is you use the dot operator. So now I hit this dot. Now IntelliJ is prompting all of these different things I can do with scanners. So a specific thing that I want to do is I want to call close. The reason that we want to call close is because we don't want to leave this system.in resource open after we don't need it. In the context of a program like this, it doesn't make a huge difference, but it's good practice to know when you're using a resource when to close it. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to prompt the user for input. But first we need to print something to the screen because if you just have a blank screen and the user doesn't know what to do, that's not going to be very effective. So I'm going to ask the user, enter a line of text. Now, another thing that we like to do as programmers, I'm going to go ahead and compile and run this using that Shift F10 hotkey on Windows. We as programmers like to iteratively run our code and make sure that we are doing what we think we are. It's frustrating if you've written all this code and then it doesn't work on line two or three and then you need to go backtrack and figure out what happened. If you run iteratively and figure out where your mistakes are as they're happening, you can often catch things a good bit faster. So if we look at what happened, it entered our text as we expected, but then it says that process finished. So that means that our program ended. So we didn't actually prompt the user for input yet. So what I need to do next is I need to actually have this user data variable do something. So I'm going to say user data dot next line. Now if I run this, you'll notice that the code is still running. It doesn't say process terminated. I'm going to enter some text and now the code's finished. Okay, so I haven't done anything with the text that I wrote, but now the program is waiting for me to enter something before it terminates. So now that I am entering text, I want to actually capture it into my program. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're assigning the variable input, which is a string, to the result of what our user data variable is collecting. Now, how do I make sure that this actually worked? Okay, why don't I print out input after I'm done with it? Look at that, so it just echoed what I sent, cool. Okay, but that's kind of boring. Why don't I format the output to be something that's a little more interesting? You entered. You entered yo, very good. But I want to quote the entry that I entered here. But the problem with quoting is if I put quotes here, now it's treating input as a string rather than my variable name. So I need to add quotes into my string here without adding them around my variable name. The way I do that is with what's called an escape sequence. If you add a backslash, the next character is escaped from being interpreted as part of the string. So if I add that there, that is the left quotation mark. Now I'm gonna add another one. Now this is the next string at the end. I'm going to add another escape sequence. Okay, let's test this maybe with some extra white space. And there we go. We can see that the output of our program exactly was equal to what we input. That's the basics of how you might be manipulating string input data and then from there you can do whatever you want with the string whether that is doing more processing in your code or whether it's just regurgitating it to the user. 
All right, I promised we would do some arithmetic, so let's change up our code to do some arithmetic now. Prompt user for first number. Enter number one. Now what we need to do is instead of the next line function, we're gonna use the next int function. Now it's complaining, why is that? Because we are trying to assign a string variable to an integer output, okay? So let's just change this to an integer. We'll call this num1 and delete that line. I'm gonna copy these lines and I'm going to now ask the user for a second number. Give me number two. Now let's print out number two and number one to make sure that they are what we expect. Okay, let's add a five and eight. All right, five and eight, very good. Now let's actually do something with the numbers. Let's add them. Equals. Let's multiply them. Let's divide them. Multiplication. Then let's do, let's collect the modulus or what's called the modulo of the numbers. So the modulo is going to be how much there is remainder when you take num2 and num1. So for instance, if you had the numbers eight and three, eight modulo three would be two because the remainder on eight divided by three with integer division would be two. All right, I got a couple misspellings here. Now let's print these out. So I don't want to do a whole bunch of print line functions for each of these. So I'm going to use a different method called printf. That f there means formatted. So now I'm going to print out a formatted string. So what I have to do is I'm going to do what's called string formatting, where I'm going to put in a indicator that I want to print a particular variable. And we'll call this one addition here. That percent sign means the next characters that I enter here are indicating to the program what type of data I want it to print. That D there, that you can think about that as a base 10 number. So integers, longs, shorts, bytes, anything in that category would be printing here. And I want to print multiplication, division, and modulus. Multiplication, division, modulus. Oh, and look at that. I can't I can't forget subtraction. That has to be there. What are you thinking, Will? You gotta make sure you get that in there too. Alright. Addition, subtraction. That's better. Okay. Now let's run this code. Alright, let's do some easier numbers. Let's do ten and two. 10 plus 2 is 12, 10 minus 2 is 8, 10 times 2 is 20, 10 over 2 is 5, and 10 mod 2 is 0. Cool. That looks like that's working properly. Great. Let's see if we can break this code a little bit, or let's see what it can handle. All right, let's try some negative numbers. Addition, that looks reasonable. Subtraction. Now you'll notice that multiplication seems off. When you multiply a negative number by a positive number, you should be getting a negative number. But what you're seeing here is something we talked about in our primitive types video where you're getting overflow. This looks to be, so this is over a million and this is over a thousand. So a thousand times a million is a billion. If I do a quick math here, this would be exceeding that negative two billion mark, which is why we're gonna wrap over into positive territory. The thing you gotta be really careful with with user input is you need to make sure that 
you can handle all sorts of different bounds checking and you want to be able to handle all the different things that even a user with malicious intent might be able to do with your code. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch all of these to longs. Now this is gonna take a little while. All right, now if we run the code again, let's try breaking it one more time here. Times big number, a little over a million times just under a million. Addition looks good. Subtraction looks about right. There we go. Multiplication is now in the correct realm. Division is odd. We'll talk about that in a second. And then the modulus seems about right. Now the thing you'll notice here is that the division is a little weird. Negative one, what's the deal there? The reason for that is because in Java, integer division or base 10 division in general results in not saving off a decimal value. The reason for that is because when you divide two integers, Java by default doesn't save off a fractional double, it just saves off the integer results of that, which when computers perform division like that, they truncate the decimal. So if I take five over two, normally that would be 2.5, but five over two with Java, with integer division and many other languages would actually give you a result of two. Similarly, if I take nine over 10, it doesn't round. You would think nine over 10 would be really close to one, but the result is actually zero. So I wanna fix this. So I'm going to have it return a double. And now what I need to do is I need to tell Java that I want this to be returned like a double. Because what IntelliJ is warning me here is integer division and floating point context. So I'm saying, hey Java, when you do this operation, please interpret it as a double. What I'm doing here, this is called a cast. I can talk more about casting in a future video. But the general idea is the default operation between two integers is integer division and I want to do floating point division. So that's what that is. Now the next thing that IntelliJ is telling me is that I have a double variable but I'm trying to use the percent %d format specifier which as we talked about d is referring to base 10 integer numbers. So I want to use floating point there. That indicates to Java that I want to interpret that number as a floating point number instead. So let's enter similar inputs as last time. Now we can see here that outputs more like what we would expect. Almost negative 1.25. So as the last thing, let's make this format a little bit prettier. I'm gonna go ahead and Type in addition here. Now in here, I wanna add a new line in the output. The way I do that with the formatted print function is I add another format specifier, percent %n. So now this is on a new line, another new line, multiplication, another new line, vision, Modulus. Now this is going off the screen a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is add in some extra lines there. I'm gonna go ahead and run the code. All right, let's enter similar data. All right, very good. That format is a good bit prettier than what we were looking at previously and clearly spells out what each of the different outputs are. Now I wanna show one more thing to show that code can always be improved. This code is currently assuming that I've got a user who plays nice and actually enters in integer numbers. Let's say I wanna enter in number one and I'm not paying attention. Oops, my program just crashed. This is what's called a stack trace. It's telling me that this input mismatch exception was thrown within the main thread 
and it gives me all of the context of when this happened. My part of the program was at line 10 right here. So this is telling me that I was trying to interpret a string as a long and this next long method didn't like that. Validating user input and making sure that we can handle all sorts of what are called exceptions that can arise is out of the scope of this video, but I want to demonstrate that there are continuously ways that we can improve our code and this is one such example and we'll cover that in the future topic. Well, I hope that you found that helpful. You now understand the basics of how to use the scanner class within Java and how to have it retrieve different types of data for you. In a future video, we'll talk about how you would handle the case that we did at the end there where you've got an exception and the user wasn't being nice and doing what you wanted. And then we'll be able to make more and more complicated programs that can handle more and more edge cases. Hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Like, subscribe, and take a moment to write a comment if you thought it was interesting or if you want to discuss anything further with it. I hope to see you guys next time. Have a great day and see you later.